It's time for the movie rate, and tonight we go behind the screams with John Harrison, film composer from Day of the Dead film. Hello. How you doing, Mike? What's going on? Uh, just hanging out in uh, sunny, hot Southern California at the moment. Enjoying the barbecues recently? <laughs> no, actually, uh, I've been working. I've been busy. Um, well, that's not entirely true. I've, I've made a little time to hang out with a couple of people and have a few dogs and burgers. Tell us, how would how you get approached to this uh, film, per se? Well, uh, I knew George uh, from a long time, and we had done different projects together, including uh, the movie uh, before this called Creep Show. And um, there was a period of time when George was trying to get Day of the Dead up, and it was going through different incarnations. He had a much larger, uh, more expensive, more elaborate script that he was trying to get off the ground at one point. When we couldn't raise the money to do that particular script, he revised it into a uh, more manageable production, which is what ended up on the screen, and in fact uh, has become kind of a classic now. So, and I guess you'd say it kind of all worked out well. So... I was in, uh, I had come back out to Los Angeles after Creep Show and was uh, directing episodes of his Tales from the Dark Side TV show and writing them and, uh, and doing the music for them. They were, uh, you had to be a sort of a full service enterprise for those. And uh, they were a lot of fun. And at, at the time uh, the money came through, he said, you know, come on back, let's, uh, let's do this. And so my wife and I flew back. She was the production uh, coordinator and uh, I was the AD and worked with George. We did the, the shoot, and then I segued into the music composition. When you composing, did you have full control as far as the creative process goes, or did George also have a hand in this? Oh, well, George always had a hand in it. I mean, the thing about George is, first of all, he's a, a very gifted film editor, and um, as a result, even though he's not a musician, he has an incredible musical sense. I was always astonished at how he, uh, he had, first of all, he had a wonderful collection of film scores, so he knew movie music. Um, but he also was able to create scores out of library cues and what we call needle drops because he never had the money for original scores in his early films, and so he would put together scores out of pre-existing cues, and because he was such a fabulous editor, he could put together two or three cues and make them some, sound like something entirely new. So he always had a great musical sense and a real knowledge of what he wanted for his films, and when Creepshow came along, um, and I did that for him, he and I collaborated uh, constantly on, on what that was going to sound like. That translated into our working uh, relationship on Day of the Dead. The great thing about working with George is that he wanted me to be around all the time in post-production, and if you know the business uh, very well, that's really kind of a luxury for a composer. Most times, composers and directors have precious little time together. The composer is given a cut of the film. He writes by himself. Maybe he shows temp cues to the director. Maybe sends over a couple of pieces of music just to get approvals. But the next time the director sees it often is on the uh, scoring stage. In this case, I was able to be back in the Berg for the entire post-production period. And so I'd be downstairs in a little cubbyhole that we set up where I brought all my gear. And Pat Booba and George, uh, Pat Booba the editor, and George would be upstairs. They'd be working on cuts. They'd, they'd come downstairs and they'd drop like VHSs through the mail slot. <laughs> and I would, I would get them and load them up and I would write to them. And then I was able to bring cues upstairs and say, temp cues, and say, what do you think of this? And George would say, yeah, man, a little of this or a little more of that. Um, and uh, I'd go back down, revise it. So by the time I got to the recording studio to do the score uh, for the soundstage, it was almost completely written, and we'd, we'd already seen it against the movie, so there were no surprise. It was a fabulous way to work. And uh, so he was involved deeply all the way through. Now, was this the uh, same equipment you used as you did in Creepshow, or was this a whole new setup? Um, I had more gear for day. Um, you know, the technology moves so fast, and it was moving so fast back then, <clears throat> that uh, by the time we got to day, which was, I think, about four years later, five years later, than, uh, than Creepshow. There were all kinds of new things that, that I could play with. Essentially, it was the same gear. It was a couple of music processors, and uh, I, was, I brought in a, a fabulous guitarist named Grant Geisman to play with me on day. Um, we had a, a wonderful percussionist. I played the bass. So it was a little bit more elaborate in some ways than the Creepshow score, and obviously a completely different style and sound. Essentially the same kind of thing. We didn't have the budgets back then to, to hire orchestras or 
even even uh, small uh, ensembles to do the score. I had to do everything. <laughs> Uh, the score itself is different compared to other horror films. Uh, this one's a distinctive sound. W- what what were you aiming for as far as the direction goes, the creative direction? Where... Well, we had talked about this a lot, and one of the things that we uh, definitely wanted to do that I had pitched to George was, why don't we be a little counterintuitive about this? And instead of writing the normal kind of creepy, uh, full of shocks and stings horror score, why don't, we, why don't we go against the grain a little bit? The movie, as you know, is very grim. The world uh, it creates is very dark, in many ways hopeless. <laughs> and um, so I thought, well, that could be kind of an unrelenting emotional drag for two and a half, for two hours. Maybe we can lighten it up. Uh, we can use the music to find those moments of humor that George always has in his movies. We could give it a broader texture. You know, it's a very claustrophobic movie. It's all down in the in the caves and just occasionally outside. And I thought the music could could really go against against the grain a little bit and help that. Out. When George had written the original version, the big, the bigger script, it was set in southern Florida and the Keys, and it really had a very Caribbean feel to it. So I went with that as kind of a theme and started fooling around with motifs that were in that kind of vein. And uh, I put together a, a small demo of a couple of themes that I was working on, and George really loved them. Well, then, when the new script came in, and he had to abandon that whole idea, we kept the ideas that I had written for the music. Uh, Those were the ones that ended up in the film. It was a little controversial at the time. There were a lot of people who didn't like that score at the beginning because they thought, well, it's not horror enough. Uh, You know, it's not scary. It's not creepy. Yeah, there's no bum or bah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, not the real weird, creepy strings that make chills go up your spine. You know, ee, 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 you know, the, yeah. the the big shock stings that come out, and whenever anything happens, um, it was much more lyrical. But over time, it's actually become uh, very popular, and people really dig it. And uh, you know, last year they put out a, a new collector's edition CD and LP. Uh, it's, I guess it up over time and then sometimes you'll hear just a regular band playing throughout you know a gore scene someone hacking someone to death or something like that yeah but for this type of piece of music this is this actually stands out it's something different it's not too poppy it actually fits very well with each scene as you watch the film it, it pulls you in there even toward the end you hear you can hear the zombies coming in yeah well you know george and i i, I told you george had this unbelievable collection of soundtracks i mean i have a bunch but man, he has uh, wall-to-wall uh, great, great scores. And not just horror scores. I mean, we're talking the greats of, you know, well, I would say younger guys like Jerry Goldsmith, but, you know, going back to Bernard Herrmann and Korngold and Franz Waxman and all those guys, their kinds of music, the way they fit the film, the way they supported the emotional uh, moments in the movies were things that George and I really dug. The fact that we were doing a horror movie didn't mean that we were going to abandon that. We wanted this music to have the same quality as those kinds of scores that we love. That's why that's why it works the way it does, I think. Yeah, a little bit influential from each scene as you, as you hear the music, every piece puts together. Yeah, there are themes, obviously repetitive motifs that we restate them different ways. They have different orchestrations so that given the, the different scene, they make sense. It is, it, I hope, it's kind of a unified whole. Yeah, uh, as far as the uh, promotion goes, how did that fare out with you? Because this is back in 1985, you mind you. <laughs> well, when you mean promotion, you mean in terms of getting a soundtrack out and yes, everything? Yes, yes. Um, well, at the time, Tom Cozzi, who owns Saturn Records, came to me, and he's a Pittsburgh boy, and he wanted to put the release out, and we did. You know, I honestly don't know how well it did. You know, with these small... The movie, of course, did not do great when it first came out. So, by extension, the soundtrack didn't either. Um, But over the years, it's continued to play. You know, I hear it on the radio and on on channels that are devoted to genre movies. And then La La Land has put it out twice now. And uh, the guys down at Waxwork in New Orleans have put out the first LP version of it. You know, it never got the kind of... I guess you'd say studio system soundtrack album promotion. Or at least recognition for it. I mean, it's there, but they didn't exactly took the bait, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, there weren't big trade ads. It's hung around, so... (laughs) 
I ain't complaining. Yeah, it's a little bit hypocritical because back then they'll tear down horror films or even other horror, other uh, genre films uh, that were really, really good. But uh, until you fast forward now, it's like they became cult classics all of a sudden. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, there was the occasional uh, tubular bells that would come out or uh, Goldsmith score for um, Dick Donner's movie uh, about Damien. What was that called? I forget. And there were the occasional big time scores that would be associated with uh, with horror movies, The Exorcist or, you know, that kind of thing. But, but the genre movies, um, you're right. They were kind of second-class citizens, and I think the scores were too. And in a way, uh, the the actual score in, in some aspects, it's almost like it's too underrated to really appreciate it because you, it's there, you hear it, but and the only thing they really want is like, um, for example, Michael Jackson Thriller. Yeah. Something like that and, uh, of the new era. And I know I said this before. Well, yeah. that's it, you know, And but there have been so many really good composers working in the genre. I mean, Joe, Joe LaDuca working with Sam Raimi and um, Chris Young working with so many greats, including George once. And, you know, there are a lot of first-rate musicians that have played in this territory. Recently, there's been more respect given the genre. I mean, we are now living in the world of fantasy and horror on television and in movies. Uh, quite a bit different. I mean, I'm talking, you know, we're all talking big-time stuff now. So I think the pendulum has swung a little bit, are respecting it a little bit more than they did back then. Yeah, slowly but surely. But when it comes to this film, did you actually, were you actually a little hesitant since it didn't get great reviews at the time? And did you feel this um, kind of will kind of hurt your career a little bit, even though even though it is has George Romero's name on it, though? No, not really, Mike, because you see, here's the thing. I didn't set out to uh, create a career as a film composer. I kind of almost fell into it by accident. And that was because of working with George. Back in the day when we were in the Berg and we were doing things, it was really independent filmmaking. I mean, we put together crews of people, and basically the only thing that we had in terms of real movie-making skills was our enthusiasm. We just, uh, you know, people learned by doing. And so I happened to be the guy with a piano. So when when it came to, well, we're going to need some music for this, who do we call? Well, Harrison's got a piano. So that's how I kind of fell into it. I was very lucky that that break enabled me to work in that in that field for a while. I did George's scores. I did uh, the scores for Tales from the Dark Side television series for some of them, music for my own film like Tales from the Dark Side, a Paramount movie. It allowed me to get into a career that I really had never anticipated. So I don't feel that the, the lack of uh, immediate success of Day of the Dead hurt me at all. I, I really wasn't out here in Hollywood trying to get an agent, trying to get on to big films uh, or anything like that. I was very happy to play in this little sandbox with people I knew because I was also developing my writing and directing career at the same time. I look back on that time very fondly and I'm thrilled when people like Waxwork and La La Land come along and say we want to re-release this and then we have screenings and the fans show up and everything. I mean, it's it's terrific. No, I don't, I don't think it hurt me at all. <laughs> Well, do you think a little bit they should go back to the old ways when making scores or anything that you're film related in, into this generation? Because it seems when you look back then at that time, yeah, it was primitive. It was still a new age at that time as far as technology goes. Trying to get it out there, it was very difficult at the time. Now it's kind of a little bit, a lot more easier, a little bit more at ease at the time when it comes to technology. But uh, but as far as popularity goes, uh, not as great. It's just all about the big bucks rather than the actual quality of the film and the quality of the soundtrack. Well, it's kind of a complicated issue you're raising there. Um, I think since technology has made it so much easier in many ways to create uh, elaborate scores. It, there's a tendency, I think, not to take it maybe as seriously. Uh, obviously, if you're dealing with the big movies, there's a great deal of money and resources thrown at that. But what really kind of is lacking that I see right now is sort of the collaboration between the filmmaker and the composer. You know, I've always felt that music is as much a story element as the cinematography or the dialogue. And if it's done properly, it can convey so many things that the filmmaker is trying to say with the movie in terms of emotional context, even plot devices and things like that. My experience with George taught me that the collaboration between the director or the filmmaker and the composer could really be productive. It could really be special. And there have been other examples of this throughout history. I mean, 
the obvious ones are Spielberg and Williams or Hitchcock and Bernard Herrmann, you know, those kinds of relationships. But look at the scores that come out of those things. The reason is the composer and the filmmaker are collaborating on the story. And the composer is basically delivering to the filmmaker a vision musically of what the movie is about. A lot of times what happens now is it's really a, it's an afterthought, and that's the problem. Yeah, there's like no communications. A lot of times it would be one specific person, like let's say, for example, a director and or writer that just wants to do their own way, their own direction, and kind of force it on the other person. Oh, okay, fuck, because of time restraints and money restraints, and they just end up having a bad product in the end. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of directors I've encountered don't have a musical background. They don't have um, a lot of intuitive feeling about what what should be done. Uh, many of them would say, well, just play it for me. I'll know it when I like it. And But it's like anything. If you don't know about it, you can educate yourself about it. And uh, rather than kind of consider it after the fact or just kind of some kind of undertone, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't not engage your cinematographer I in shooting it. You should engage your composer in the same way, I think. Well, go ahead and plug in anything that you like, any projects you're involved in, or any, any more advice you'd like to give. Well, I mean, anybody that's interested in doing the compositions, doing music, movie music, I mean, I'm almost kind of jealous because, um, as I said, the technology enables people now to do so much more elaborate things than I was able to do, unless you had money. I, I think if anybody is, is interested in doing it, then I would encourage them just to align themselves with, with filmmakers, get to know filmmakers, spend time with them, and, and work with them that way. You know, there's so many marvelous opportunities now for all kinds of projects to be made, and I would, you know, not turn down any work. Just do it, uh, do anything that comes along, because everyone, every, every one of those experiences will be a learning experience. Well, there you go. And this is the Day of the Dead special, Behind the Screams with composer John Harrison.